Four game sweep at home by the Triple A Braves. The Marlins have hit maybe a new season low in 2022, but nevertheless, I'm still watching, kind of. Sean Barrett's still watching. We're going to dig into all of the action and look ahead to Sandy Alcantara starting tonight on today's Locked On Marlins. You are Locked On Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Marlins. It is, of course, your daily Marlins podcast with me, Peter Pratt. Follow me on Twitter, of course, at Miami Marlins underscore UK. Subscribe to the pod. It's available free and everywhere you get your pods. And if you so choose, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We are trending. We're almost at 200 subscribers. Absolutely big time here on Locked On Marlins. No doubt about it. And if you're watching and you listen to the intro, you will see and know the UK GOAT is back in town. Sean Barrett on the regular Monday rotation. How are we doing, brother? I'm doing well, Peter. This heat doesn't seem to be stopping, but uh, it's, uh, it's a lovely time of the year. Maybe not on the field, but uh, no. that's for sure. No. Any any uh, any doubles this weekend during uh, actual gameplay? Just just a single for me this oh, week. Oh, okay. Oops. Okay, he's trending. He's trending the wrong direction. Oh, boy. More, more time with the weights, I think, for Sean Barrett. No, not enough speed. No, too much speed balls, not enough weights. I think that's the problem. So, okay, sweet. Well, guys, firstly, before we get rocking and rolling on this episode, and we have a new segment, by the way. So I'll I'll hold that back, what the new segment is, but it's a brand new one that me and Sean are going to be doing every Monday now going forwards. But I have to call it out. This week, huge week on Lockdown Marlins. We have got, it's jam-packed. There's five guests in five days. Yes, it's a daily podcast. Sean Barrett is in the leadoff spot here on Monday. Uh, but we have five stunning guests. Sean Barrett, takes were made, Alex Ferrer, Will Manso, Loud Marlins fan. Five. And it is going to be wild. This team is in such a bad spot that these conversations are going to be likely unfiltered. They're going to be wild. I know it. And here's the thing, guys. I'm putting it out there to you. So if you follow him on Twitter, you would have seen. I'm asking. The mailbag is open for the first time. There has not been a Locked On Marlins mailbag open at all since I've been doing the show. But I want to make sure that there are no blind spots. I'm not I'm not missing questions I should be asking. Sometimes I can be blinded by certain things. So I want to make sure you guys will make sure that I don't miss anything. So send them in. I've probably already had six to seven questions already submitted. All stunners. So I will gather them up. I'll feed them into the right guys at the right times to get the right reactions that I know you want to hear about this team and this Marlins team, no doubt. So with that being said, Sean, uh, a four-game series over the weekend against the Bravos. For those that follow me on Twitter again would have seen, I didn't watch any baseball on Saturday. I was enjoying Simply Red. It was a stunning concert in Darlington. Simply Red, they've still got it. Mick Hucknell still got the voice. Not sure about the looks, but nevertheless, um, there wasn't as much baseball on Saturday that I would have uh, you know, liked to have taken in, but... Nevertheless, I watched all of Sundays and there was some pain. In you know, let's summarize this series. It was a four-game sweep by the Braves, who are really pressing on to you know chase down the Mets. Key takeaway from your perspective from from this series? I mean, it's just prototypical a Marlins twenty twenty two, isn't it? Non offense and the bullpen not being able to maintain leads. But you know, at the end of the day, the team are on this stretch now where they're scoring less than four runs uh, at a historic rate, and and that's yeah. kind of where we are now with the Marlins and. And as you said, at this point of the season now, it's, it is a case of trying to find these reasons to watch, trying to find, you know, the, everything else seems a little bit more interesting right now than watching the Marlins. So it's a bit of, <laughs> it's a, bit of a struggle, but we sold you through because we love the team and we yeah. love baseball, but it is trying at times for sure. I'm with you. What what are the things now that stick out to you when you think of this Marlins team? Uh, you know, we've got Sandy going, and we're going to talk about Sandy shortly anyway. But you know, take away Sandy starts. What else is kind of getting you excited or the juices flowing right now from like watching the games? If there's, I don't know how long that list is. No, it's, it's not long. Yeah, no, it's, it's looking, <laughs> forward, looking forward to next season. Okay, you know, it, it's looking at guys like you know Pablo. Can he mm. stay healthy? Can he continue to perform how he's performing? And it's the young guys, isn't it? It's, it's Bladé and it's Eddie and it's it's the guys like that that 
you want to see where the team are next year. You want to have that optimism next year. Yeah. We don't want to be going into next year not knowing what we what we've got on the roster. And to mm. a certain degree, you can say that that's kind of where we are at the moment. The way that the team haven't brought up those young guys, they haven't brought up those guys that were hitting well and pitching well in the minors. If you look back at Maya, obviously he got injured in the end, but we kept on saying, when are they going to bring him up? When are they going to bring him up? And and it is a case of now these young guys haven't got, and we spoke about this last week, they haven't got this long period of time to display what they can do. And we are going to go into next year. You know, maybe we jump the gun a little bit much by saying that this is their only opportunity, but it, 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 you could argue it is. But yeah. my main takeaway is that we haven't given them the opportunity. We're going to go into next year if we retain them, go in, we don't know who they are. And they are going to be guys that are going to be trusted and, and relied on to be starters. And we, it'll be horrible going into next year not knowing whether or not we can trust these guys because that's where we are at the moment. So hopefully over the next sort of couple of weeks, a couple of months, we can see them drive on and perform well. At the moment, that's not quite been the case, mm-hmm. uh, specifically the batting um, as opposed to the pitching. Eddie's looked pretty good. Um, but yeah, no, it is that a case of that's what's bringing us to, to watch the games if it is bringing people to watch the games. I, I I get the feeling now that there's you know the vibe more generally now is that you know people are tuning out now and they're not they're not dedicating their time to the Marlins and my main takeaway from the weekend series yes I I wasn't watching the game and I wasn't there Saturday game two in the doubleheader game one the Marlins they played it with a straight bat I think Lazardo went in game one and Donnie said hey we're going to go with a bullpen game first takeaway is. There's not been many of them this year for the Marlins. If you think back to 21, boy, oh boy, the, with the three-man rotation and the bullpen games, just like every other, what, second, third day, you'd have a bullpen game and they just muddled and mixed a match forever. I'm glad we haven't had that situation this year. So I am thankful to the Marlins that we haven't had to do that again this year. And it's been nice because you had Braxton Garrett emerging, um, you know, which has been great to see. Brax has really kicked on. Further solidifies to me that Mel Stottermeyer can make it happen. The Marlins can make it happen. We know all of this. However, on the flip side, the negative side, my other main takeaway was in game two on Saturday when I was watching Simply Red, holding back the years was pumping. I was loving it. At that moment in time, the Marlins, in my opinion, they should refund all of the fans that were there in attendance or every single one of them. They should be given a credit to either their bank or their whatever kind of uh, season ticket arrangement points you have. They should refund every fan that went to that game. Marlins fans. If there was Braves fans, no, they should pay double. Anyway, the reason being, for that game in particular, I believe the Marlins really did not put their best foot forward. And it's still one game. It's still, it's it holds the same weight as any other game. But they, in my opinion, did not put their best foot forward. They really were in, that was a tank mode season decision. We're going bullpen. We're going to promote a dude called Ladwig. No one's ever heard of him. He's in double A. He's there to give some arm, some some, lev- some length, whatever. And the dude comes up, throws a couple of innings. He makes his debut and he's DFA'd the day after. The Marlins didn't want to win on Saturday. They didn't in game two. They, they made that perfectly clear to me. I hate that. I hate that. And for me, they should refund every fan that was there. I've said that three times. They should. I didn't have to watch it since Simply Red were great. But that was my main takeaway. That we, for the first time this year, I feel, from a pitching perspective anyway, tried not to win a game. No, no, maybe that's not the right way of phrasing it, but the decisions made meant that they had one, two arms and a leg tied behind their back, perhaps. And yeah, of course, the Braves on the first pitch, Ronnie Acuna destroys one, one nil down after one pitch. And you think, boy, oh boy, this is going to be a long game. And it didn't get out of hand. I have to call that out. Nance actually struck out a bunch. He uh, got back to Ronnie, struck him out looking. Sean, I want to ask you just on Ronald Acuna specifically, um, there will forever be the theme of Ronald Acuna and the Marlins. It will forever exist now because of the history. Um, I have to say the celebration was over elaborate in my opinion, like a first pitch home run to go one nil up and he was acting like it was walk off season or something. And I get it. There's a history. He doesn't act that way many of the other times against many of the other teams. And so when you do that, you are doing something out of character to twist the knife to the Marlins, to wound them up. 
I guess. And he's been hit multiple times. Just what was your take on that sequence in general from Ronnie Acuna after that first pitch home run? I'm, I'm sure he's been practicing the Euro step in his hotel room the night before. As he, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, pur- purposely doing it as he's coming around third base to the to the home dugout. Um, you know, it's. I've had some spicy takes about him and and, and the way that this is all going on, um, especially you know the 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 Marlins have got hit by pitch more by the Braves than Acuna has by the Marlins, but mm-hmm. because it's made such a big deal of that, that's that's the storyline. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, had it been Jazz against anybody else, we'd all be you know rooting for him and cheering for him and saying you know stop being so old old man you know, yelling at clouds, this is a new baseball, this is entertaining. Um, and at the end of the day, if the Marlins want him to to stop him from doing that, they've got to just pitch better. Um, and that's the end of uh, at the end of it for me. At the end of the day, he's one of the better players in the league and we're going to see an awful lot of him for the next 10 years. So we better get used to either playing better against him or expect these kind of things to occur. No doubt. And it was a meatball from Nance, straight down the middle, middle, middle. Ronnie absolutely demolished it. I am, there's no doubt in that. It was, it was a stunning home run. Um, the celebration was way over the top, though, way over for for a first pitch. Like, okay, you hit a salami in the eighth to go ahead by a run, absolutely. But it was just, it would seem extreme. But it is what it is, you know. Like you said, you know, you can celebrate how you want to hit a home run, but. You know, there's an undercurrent of Major League Baseball that that doesn't that isn't the actual reality. As much as people want that to be, and as much as hey, Braves fans will love it, of course. Stop yelling to old clouds, old white boy. Let them have fun, whatever. There's still a degree of sportsmanship and professionalism, and Ronald Acuna he still has some growing up to do in many ways, and so it is what it is. Um, we're going to get into Sean's new segment straight after the first ad. It is a brand new segment, and I'm going to tease it out to you now. This new segment is called, now wait for it, Sean's Stats. <laughs> it's a working title, no doubt. Um, but what I've asked Sean to do, here's the brief. It is to go away in advance of these sessions on a Monday, in these episodes, and to just tease out some some key stats we're seeing. Because I know some of you guys are not watching the games. You're still listening to Lockdown Marlins. I know you are. But some people are not watching the games as closely as they maybe had been earlier in the year. So Sean's going to bring some key themes and stats to life for us. And we can talk about those those players. Uh, he's already mentioned one, which is the fact that the Marlins are on a historically poor run for scoring less than four runs. Currently at 15 games, I believe, straight with less than four runs scored. And they are going for a 1955 record, I believe, tonight against the Padres. So wait and see. Anyway, first out of the day, guys, it's our good, good friends over at LinkedIn. You've heard this one before. I know it. Listen, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Solutions is your gear up for fall. You need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. So do the Marlins and their offense. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and maybe, more importantly, for free. So you can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs, and it reaches a network, well, your network and beyond. And it's the world's largest professional network. It's got eight, over 810 million people. Wild scenes. Wild, wild scenes. So here's what you got to do. Add your job, and you get the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. Spread the word you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. So you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. Small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So how do you get started? Real easy. LinkedIn jobs to help you find candidates you want to talk to faster. And did you know every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Massive market, massive, massive market. Get that job posted for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That is linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job. Yes, for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Right then, Sean Barrett. I have given it the biggest of big buildups in advance. Sean Stats, episode one on Monday, is live. I'll hand it over to you, Senor. What have you got for us? Well, so a couple of things for you. So mm-hmm. we've spoken a little bit recently about Fortes and how he came up and he was hitting well. And should he get the, the bulk of the starts? What are we going to do next year with stallings? Um, so, yeah, a little bit of a dive into it. 
13th of July, so just over a month ago for Cortez, you know, he's cooled down massively. So it's mm -hmm. a line of 185-214-259, an absolutely minuscule 1.8 walk rate. Um, he's really wow. struggled, yeah, really struggled at the plate recently. That's good for or bad for a 35 WRC plus. So it's been a massive change from that, that hot start that, that it came from. And I mm. do recall saying to you, let's call our jets, small sample size and everything like that. You and, did. And unfortunately, that has come to pass. Okay. One good thing that comes from that is that Stallings is actually starting to warm up himself. <laughs> he is. Um, so yeah. as far as the storyline goes, I think that the Marlins still will have to look at Stallings next year as their starting capture. Um, and let's hope that this little hot streak that he's going through continues for the rest of the year and we see you know, what was advertised when he first came to the team because even with this little hot start uh, recently, he's still not anywhere close to where he was offensively um, you know, previously. Now, he was never a big offensive guy. He was you know, floating around sort of 90, 95 WRC+, plus, but I think... He's around sort of mid sixties at the moment, so he still needs to keep hitting well mm. to get up to those average numbers. But I think that is one storyline that I'm looking at as far as what I just said earlier about the idea that we need to see what we've got for next year, and I think we yeah. still need to see more from Stallings, not just offensively but also defensively. Um, and then yeah. just one one little fun one that I've had, which is Aggie, who we couldn't trade at the deadline for a bucket of balls. We literally he was unmovable. Um, so for him personally, it's a really interesting time. He's He knows he's dead wood. He knows that he's not going to be with this team next year. So he's probably advertising for some suitors. Mm -hmm. So he's gone really power heavy recently. So since the deadline, he's only hitting 212, so a, a small batting average. But he's hit three home runs, which actually drag his number at 128 WRC+. Plus. And the reason why I know that he's going for the home run is... His fly ball percentage is massively above his career. So his career number is 41%. He's currently at 56%. He's also pulling the ball 52% compared to a 41% uh, career number. So Aggie is literally going up to a bat since the trade deadline and just pulling the ball, trying to put it in the air, mm -hmm. looking to put in the home runs. Because even now, with everything we know about numbers, Teams still look at, and the arbitration number actually still look at the home run massively. Yeah. So he knows that the home run equals money. So that's all he's doing right now is just trying to pull that ball into those stands. Let me. Uh, there you go. This is exactly this is exactly why I wanted to start this segment because it takes us off into into conversations and topic areas that maybe we wouldn't have. And uh, so there we go. The debut of Sean Stats, and I think you know two. Two slash three, um, really nice uh, themes and interesting ones there that we can kind of get into. Let's go back to Fortes and Stallings. Can I just say though that I I think again I've said this all year, the Marlins' ability to ride a hot hand, it happens time and again over and over. Stallings was uh, sorry, Fortes obviously scorching early doors. Play him. Play him at that moment. When he cools, he cools. They want to give you more playing time once you've cooled. I've done it so many times this year, so I would have to say that. It's great to see Stallings um, you know, actually starting to get back to you know, the player he was last year, or kind of you know, back towards that way anyway. And it's big for the Marlins. At the end of the day, they traded for this guy. They gave away multiple pieces to go and get Jacob Stallings. He has two remaining years of arbitration as well. So two more years of control. Stallings is going to be around the Marlins now for some time. He's obviously a defensive first catcher that we talked about. We knew that. We knew what we were getting into, getting into there. We knew not to expect to lean on him for a huge offensive production. So I'm not... I'm not overly bothered about that. I need it to be better than it was. But like, you know, for him to tick back up, I think it's all good. I think... I think you've you've already said it. I think Stallings is the opening day catcher next year. I'd, I'd be shocked if he if he wasn't. To be honest with you, the only way he wouldn't be is if they decided let's go out and sign. I don't know Contreras or something, which they're never going to do. So that's not happening. Stallings and Fortes, I think, will be the duo. Is what it is. Aguilar, very interesting uh, observation as well. 
It's now it's like launch angles back, pulls back. We're going bombs away now for Aggie. Average down. All of a sudden, you know, the the, the three outcome player that's just littered across Major League Baseball. Walk, K, bomb. There we go. Nice to see from Aggie, though. Um, I'm still intrigued. He's played. Coop's been out of the lineup for a couple of days now. So I, I know he exited during the weekend. I think he's dealing with some sort of maybe calf issue or something. Is he some sort of leg muscular one? Haven't seen an update on Coop today pre-game, so I don't know he's where not, he's at. Not playing tonight, I know that. So. No, he's not. No. No. So, you know, and this kind of goes back to it. Like, they, they didn't kind of DFA Aggie once they couldn't move him, which they would have been trying to move him. But, of course, next thing is, you know, Coop's got a tweak. You know, Lewin, you, you know, you need – it's not just you, – you kind of did need three of them. I guess when we kind of sit back and look at it, you did because you need a bench guy to kind of like cycle around because one of them's DH and one of them's first base and, base and one of them's benching. And Lewin's a lefty as well, so that creates a different kind of matchup as well. But I wanted to just get into Lewin as well, mate. I mean, I've been probably up there in terms of advocates of Lewin Diaz. I always have been. I always thought he had the had a real potential to, to be a huge piece for the Marlins. Um, I've got to be honest, it's, it, it's starting to, to wane. Like... It's really not been good offensively. Defensively, of course, it's fine, but the stick is the stick's gone backwards. It seems like when he was up last year, like there was there was a lot of hope I was getting excited about, but since coming back up in twenty two, it has really not been good. What have you seen from Lewin? Uh, well, exactly what you'd ex- not what you'd expect from him, which is no power. No power. This is no. it. Where's the bombs? Yeah, no home runs, just two doubles. You know, there's been no power there at all. No. The average is, you know, is tiny as well. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think it is a case of, like, we're just not seeing what we should see from him. The no. defense is always going to be there at, at first base. That's always got less of value than other positions. But yeah. Yeah. that's still at least that's still there. But, yeah, at the moment, again... Where are we going to be next year? Are we going lay wins to start in first baseman? Because right now you can't be right now, can he? You can't, you can't say that. You can't. I mean, this is this is the point. Aggie's gone. Lay wins unproven, but you know that's an understatement. Um, he's a dice roll. Is probably what I describe it as now. Okay, you know maybe you carry him on the bench and you've got no options left anyway. So you either have to keep him on the bench and you know we know that at points like Coop's going to have niggles because he's that kind of guy and, you know, whatever. And there's always going to be niggles. There's always going to be a need for a DH and whatever. Like, you know, it is what it is. But I'm I'm just not convinced you want to roll with Coop at first base. Like, I think they found a nice, like, happy spot for Coop now. More DH, less time fielding, let him concentrate on hitting. He's so into his hitting, too. Like, I remember listening to the pod he did with Jeremy Taché. He spent so much time really kind of digging into the pitches that he's facing. He's so into that. So leave him that headspace. Leave him out there just hitting, not worrying about everything else. I think that, that you know, we've seen it this year with Coop. Like the DH, when it when he's DHing, suits him. And so the Marlins are going to have to think about first base and do want to roll with Lewin. So that, you know, back to that same point. Can they roll with Lewin? Or do they just think now we're going to move on and we'll go out and acquire a... I don't know. I don't know what the first base market looks like. I mean, Jesus Aguilar could be available. Um, Trey Mancini could be, I guess. I mean, Josh Bell could be interesting. I mean, Josh Bell is an interesting option, to be fair. I, I can't see him being extended um, in, in San Diego. So uh, we'll, we'll probably get some eyeballs on Josh Bell. But I know he's hit well in Lone Depot. He seems to always come up with a bomb in Lone Depot. Not many players can say that. So I don't know. I mean, maybe they go down that path, but it's going to be it's going to cost money. Right. You know, and we've already been down that pathway with Avi and Soleil this year. Like there's going to be some nervousness pulling the trigger on some, you know, some DH character again. So we'll wait and see. Um, Final ad. And then I wanted to uh, ask you about Sandy as well. It's a Sandy start today and we shouldn't forget that. So it should mean that we all watch this game in its full and the entirety. But I wanted to ask you about Sandy and the workload management. Craig Mish brought it up, and I think it's a a topic for us to get into. So before we do that, guys, reminder that this episode, it's brought to you by, ah, must be one of our main sponsors, betonline.net. Betonline, it's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. You can find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, limes, and games. They have everything covered. Every sport you can imagine, they've got it covered. MLB, of course. NFL, it's coming up soon too. NBA, NHL. Combat sports, esports, golf, English Premier League, you name it, they've got it covered. Liverpool with a draw tonight, not good. 
Not good. More pain for me. Anyway, Bet Online, they continue to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information. From live in game betting scores and podcasts, they have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening right now, today, tomorrow, this week. Bet Online, where the game starts. Sean, where the game starts tonight will be Sandy Alcantara going for the Marlins. And we're coming off a week where he, again, at one point, there was, you know, it was going to be less than 100 pitch complete game kind of territory. Like he was just absolutely sensational. Then, you know, ran into some problems in the eighth inning against the Phils. But the question that Craig rose was that we are now at the point of the year, the Marlins season is completely in the bin. Um, I'm going to be getting into more broader topics about this this week, actually, about whether this this needs a full reboot. But we haven't got time for that one, me and you. But Sandy Alcantara, is it time now to manage his workload downwards, start to protect him in a way? Because what we can't have is on the 104th pitch in a 1-1 game against the Mets in September when they're 30 games under 500 and Sandy gets injured and misses the whole next year. Like that just can't happen. It can't happen for the fish for many reasons. So if they are going to do it, what would that actually look like? Pitch count innings. What would you, what do you think they do? I think, I think there's many ways to skin this cat. I mean, it Mm -hmm. is of where they are at the moment. You know, if he has six, seven more starts, you know, holding them at six innings over those starts is still going to be 200, 210 uh, innings. This is going to be pushing what he did last year. You know, I think the the only thing that the Marlins should be thinking about as far as pitching Sandy is give him enough innings, give him enough starts to get that Cy Young. Because yeah. he deserves it. He's, he's, he's shown all year long that, that he's been, you know, he's leading it. You know, he's the odds favourite. You know, yeah. the only thing he needs to do is go out there six or seven more times and pitch. That's it. Doesn't matter about the wins. It doesn't matter about anything else. Just get, just get to that finish line. Yeah. And that is the only. And for Marlins fans, that's all we really have to look forward to as far as positives yeah. for this season is him getting that rightfully so award. Um, I think yes, they could go with all the arms that they've got. They could go to a six-man rotation and spread that out even more because that would benefit. You know, that extra day's rest puts mm. less stress on the arm but you know I don't want to see Sandy go in you know I don't really want to see him in the seventh ever again this year I certainly don't want to see him going over 100 pitches no way if he can get to seven in under 100 which let's be honest he probably could every single start then okay let's go that far but you know the the games don't matter the wins don't matter. The, the the results don't matter. If anything, the the main thing the Miles should be doing record wise now was making it worse. Yeah, that I, draft pick. Exactly. No Each win means nothing. It's 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 a negative at this point. Um, yeah. What we want to root for is these young guys coming through and showing some positives, and Sandy getting that side young. That's what's left for this year. You make a perf- you know multiple perfect points there, Sean, because. You know, let's let's from a Sandy perspective, he has been the best pitcher in in baseball, not just the NL, but in baseball for for many people, and so he deserves to be the Cy Young winner, and I think he will be. To your point, though, I think that the Mar he, he should never go over 100 pitches again this year, and maybe not even come close to that. And and like you said, what I do think is a realistic option, though is the six man rotation plus maybe maybe a pitch limit or something on him each time where it's like 90s the max i don't know but a six man rotation because we do we do maybe have Trevor coming back in let's say another week or so plus then you get the expanded roster to 28 in September you get an extra pitcher that you can carry you know could they then flick to the six man rotation stretch it out a bit more for Sandy you know they do need to manage his workload, I think. They do. They have to because, and there's other guys in there too that like we've got similar things, but on the reverse. What do you do with Pablo? I think for the Marlins, they want to see Pablo just go all the way through the year. They want to see pretty much a full healthy year from Pablo, but at the same time with the same thoughts, right? Like no one should be going over 100 pitches now really from the rotation at all. Um I don't think we'd see that from Cabrera. Again, Cabrera needs to have a healthy next six weeks too. 
it's huge for the Marlins. They need Sandy to just not get hurt and to win his side that he deserves. They need Pablo to go the full year. And they need Eddie to, to pitch right through the rest of this year. Braxton keep you know going up against some tall offenses because that's it's a tough schedule now. And Braxton has had a lot of nice starts against the poorer teams. Granted, he went against the Braves yesterday and pitched well again. Um, and that's what I want to see. I want to see Braxton Garrett tested. Do we know? But I think we can comfortably say now, Garrett, he's a 4-5 starter on any team right now. 4-5 on any team. Doesn't matter who you are, pretty much. You can sit in that in that five slot for anyone and pitch well. So again, an interesting one with, um, you know, with Sandy. What do they do? Should they shut him down? I don't know. I'm, I'm really intrigued. I'm intrigued to see what, what when Trevor comes back to. You know, what kind of hope should we have for Trevor Rogers this year? Or, or, you know, maybe should the Marlins just kind of nurse it where he doesn't really actually come back and they just leave him working on his game and AAA rehabbing or whatever? I mean, one thing to factor in is look, look at last year with Pablo. He came back, they rehabbed him, they came back, and he had that True. one start. And I remember talking to you and saying, I, yeah. don't it. I don't understand why they're rushing him back for that one star. And, and, but he, and then, lo and behold, he pitched well. Or we watched it live together. Mm -hmm. And it was a case of, like, I feel good now going into the next season of feeling confident about Pablo. And, and lo and behold, he's, he's pitched well. Uh, one thing to factor in, like you said, with Pablo and his workload, 129 innings so far this season. That's the most he's ever thrown. Yep. You know, this is, you know, he's been injury prone his whole career. Um, so it is that case of like, do you want him going to 180 in a lost season? I mean, you could argue that there's even more reason to to nurse Pablo than there is Sandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. It's tricky. It's tricky with Pablo. It is because it kind of depends what the Marlins want to do next in the off season. Like, if they if they have intentions of keeping Pablo, like in the main, they're going into thinking, we're probably going to keep him and not trade him. Then again, they should start just winding it down in the 160s, the max, and that's it or whatever it may be. Either way, it's a, it's a career high. Happy days, good news. But if they're looking to trade him, one of the key knocks will clearly be, well, we're not going to give you two to three stud prospects when we're basically getting the guy that's just littered with this history. We need him to show 160, more than 160, I think, in a year and show and prove that, you know, all the new routines, all the new processes that Pablo's got um, to, to keep himself healthy is working. So it's a tough one with him. Like, it's a fine balance and it maybe is at the heart of what the Marlins want to do more longer term. One final one, then we'll get out of here, mate, if that's okay. Tanner Scott, it was another, it was another wild, wild uh, inning in the ninth. It has been wild all year with Tanner Scott. It was just summarized for me against the Phillies earlier last week. Loads the bases, no outs, and then strikes out the side pretty much. I think if I recall, that's Tanner Scott in a nutshell. For me, whilst it's been a, a, a fun rodeo, Tanner Scott in the closer role feels like the Marlins are starting to shift some relievers up from AAA now that have kind of been performing there. Wouldn't surprise me to see Tanner Scott kind of move back to maybe the seventh, eighth inning or whatever it might be and, and maybe give a few others a chance in that ninth. What do you think? I mean, you might as well at this point. We've, we've said many times this is a lost season now. I remember yeah. you early in the season about Tanner Scott and the biggest change that he had and when he was having that success was that walk rate. We know the stuff's filthy. We know that he's yeah. going to get a 12K per nine at least. Yeah. But the walk rate has slowly but surely grown and grown and grown to the point where he's now at his, his major league you know, yeah. averages of like nearly a 6% walk rate, which yeah. in the closer role is just not acceptable. And it is that, say, that sense of we came into this season knowing the holes that we had. They tried the bargain basement, the, the closing situation. It just didn't yeah. work. Um, and I just hope that they, they look at next year and they say, look, that didn't work. If we are going to compete, if we are looking at that sandy window of these are the years where we need to win. The next two years, really, yep. are you know they need to bring in a genuine lockdown closer, and that ain't going to be cheap. That's going to cost yep. some money, and uh, in my mind, in this off season, they've got to do it. This the direction of this this organization it is a sliding doors moment, and in, in this off season, I am very intrigued to see where they go with it. I truly am. One final point I just wanted to add because I started going down this rabbit hole the other night. I was thinking about the draft and it's clearly, it's a new 
draft process that we're working with in this new CBA. And so I wanted to just throw it out there for those that hadn't looked into it yet and understand what it is. I just wanted to add what I believe is, is the current situation. Basically, if you don't make the postseason, you are in the lottery. You're in. You don't have to be in the bottom six, only that, to be in the lottery. Everyone that doesn't make the postseason is in. So the Marlins will be in the lottery. No matter what happens, they have a chance of looking out and getting the first overall pick, no matter where they finish. The same for anyone else. And they will go, six teams will be pulled out of the hat effectively, all of them weighted based on how bad they have been and the percentages accordingly. So clearly the worse you are, the better chance you have of ending up in those six spots. For a team that, say, finishes last overall, let's say the Nats finish 30th, um, they're the worst situation for the Nats, the worst pick they could have is seventh. They'd be picking seventh. If they weren't drawn in any of those six spots in the lottery, it would then be reverse order of the um, of, of the finishing position. So the Nats would then take the seven spots. So the Marlins are in the lottery. Six teams will be picked out. The worse the Marlins are, the better chance they have of getting into one of those six bonus spots if they aren't already in there already. I was looking at the schedule. I was looking at the other teams. I think the Marlins will be in the bottom six anyway. So knowing the Marlins, they probably won't get a top six pick and they'll end up taking seventh or eighth. That's probably the way it goes. But I wanted to call it out because I I hadn't really looked into it yet. I hadn't worked out how the lottery is going to work. So I spent a bit of time thinking, do they need to be in the six or not? No, they don't. No postseason, you're in the lottery. The Marlins are going to be in it. We may look out. I think we will be in the bottom six. And let's hope that they end up don't missing a chance on that and getting, you know, getting the pick they rightfully deserve after this year. So just wanted to add that. Sean Barrett, we are getting out of here um, for Monday. Thank you so much, mate. Sean's stats, I think, was a was an absolutely stunning success and addition to these Monday episodes, mate. So I appreciate you digging into those. And we'll look forward to more of them next week. Um, we've got a sandy start to look forward to starting in around about, well, just under an hour's time. So uh, we've got that on deck here for us. Hopefully everyone enjoys Sandy. They should be watching, no doubt. And uh, it's going to be an interesting. I'm in intrigued to see what the Padres have got. They've hit a bit of a rough skid since they went and signed or traded for Soto. Um, so they've kind of had a bit of a rough stretch. I'm intrigued to see Soto normally. Soto against Sandy was was a storyline brewing anyway. So it wouldn't shock me if Soto has a, has a breakout day as a Padre. But we'll wait and see. Um, guys, we'll be back, of course, all week. Four more episodes to go. Four more stunning guests. Please hit me up with the Marlins mailbag, and I will dig into it with those guys through the week. No doubt about it. In the meantime, enjoy Sandy. I appreciate Sean hopping on again, as always, on a Monday. I'll be back tomorrow.